Hi, everybody. Welcome to week five. I wanted to offer a bit of an introduction to the week <clears throat> um, with this short screencast. Uh, let's see. Let's look first at the schedule of the week. Uh, we're looking at a move, the movements that occur in the years prior to World War I in cities and countries outside of Paris. Remember, Paris is really the center of the art world at this point. And at the same time, because modernism fractures a bit in regard to the fact that there is not one leading movement, right? It's all these competing ideas. So you have movements outside of Paris um, in Russia and in Germany, specifically, uh, as well as Italy, so we're going to look at some of those movements. You'll want to read chapters 8, 9, and 10 in Gompertz. And um, in addition to the slide lectures below, uh, please look at the Futurist Manifesto, as well as excerpts in uh, from Kandinsky, which you'll see below. Um, there's a short video on World War I, which I introduced very briefly last week. It's really important that we understand the kinds of social conditions that are, uh, take place in Europe at the time. The best way to describe this in a quick sentence would say that would be to say that World War I represents the clash of the old world order in Europe with the mechanical age. And I think we're, we, we see that sometimes old, very entrenched ideas, especially around the aristocracy, clash with modern thinking. And uh, that unfortunately results in quite a bit of violence in uh, the World War I period. Okay, let's, um, let's see. So let's just go through what is included this week. Um, <clears throat> you'll watch the presentations, do the readings, and then there'll be a um, another discussion board. And this time you're being asked to do a visual analysis of a German expressionist piece, which you will pick. I'll talk about that a little later. Remember to do your first post by Thursday night, followed by two substantive comments by Sunday night. So your first post is your visual analysis, and then you're followed with, you follow up on comments on other people's posts. All right. Also, let's keep in mind that um, we are in week five by week twenty, by sorry, by week seven, February twenty sixth through March fourth. You're going to want to have already visited a museum and selected your artwork for your paper. So if um, we're at the beginning of week five, you'll have until February 26th to do the museum visit, but please make sure you have that organized. Um, all right, and then we have two slide presentations. Um, we have the Manifesto of Futurism by Marinetti. Please look at that and read it, and so you get a sense of the kinds of ideology that come out of the futurist movement in Italy. Um, the, there's a, a lecture on German Expressionism and the Russian avant-garde. Please look at this. What, what I, if there's one thing I can say about this week is don't get overwhelmed by the quantity of works that we're looking at or the many different movements. The best thing to keep in mind is that this, the fact that there's so much diversity there's so many different ideas about what modernism is, is really indicative. It's in a way, that's the definition of modernism, is all these competing ideas of progress, competing ways of challenging the conventional world with surprising and shocking um, artistic objects. So please, I, I think I think this week could be, very, could be one where you might feel that, um, what we're covering is a bit overwhelming. Just keep it, keep, stay, stay cool about it. Just in, in other words, uh, recognize that we're, um, we are in a period of incredible invention, and um, 
many people have very different ideas and people are part of small movements as opposed to major major movements right like impressionism even post-impressionism and cubism were major movements um, now we have a lot of smaller movements emerging okay um, there's a very good Khan Academy video that's a visual analysis of Sheila's Egon Sheila's seated nude uh, male nude actually it's a self-portrait of him and um, the this is a really good way to get a good a sense of what a, a very complete visual analysis looks like I'm going to talk about that a little bit later um, there's a selection from Kandinsky's concerning the spiritual and art these are all very short readings uh, but they really do give a nice selection uh, a nice sense of um, what what's really going through artists minds okay and then there's a crash course on World War one please watch this it's actually very good in terms of its accuracy um, again keep in mind that idea of old world versus new world okay then the discussion board is um, regarding your visual analysis of a German Expressionist artwork. Okay, so now what I want to do is just go through a couple of these pieces. Um, <clears throat> fu Italian Futurism was a really remarkable movement in that it was very deeply ingrained with, uh, with the sort of drive towards anarchism in politics as well as sort of it's been associated with a kind of neo, uh, proto or you know uh, sort of leading to ideas that would eventually foment as fascism in places like Italy and Germany which you know and I, I think we think of artists maybe as people who are not interested in these kinds of radical ideas of power however that's not necessarily the case as we can see here so look at some of these quotes from Marinetti right the beauty of speed the, a racing car whose hood is adorned with great pipes like serpents or explosive breath a roaring car that seems to ride on grape shot is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace, uh, ancient Greek sculpture Google that sculpture you'll see what I'm talking about um, we gl will glorify war the war's only hygiene, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture, the freedom bringers, beautiful ideas worth dying for, and a scorn for women. Wow. We will destroy the museums, libraries, academies of every kind. We'll fight moralism, feminism, and every opportunistic or utilitarian cowardice. Um, this is the kind of language that you know you see in kind of authoritarian governments and um, you know it's, it's kind of in the air today um, so I think it's important that we recognize that this idea of speed and motion is, is sort of living life on its radical edge and that power is all-consuming right that the idea that uh, as the as the slide lecture says that you know war is a cleansing thing it, it opens up opportunity um, you know, it's sort of like seeing a beauty and destruction. I think, you know, these are kind of dangerous ideas. Um, but this is, this is what the, uh, what the futurists believed. Okay, let's move on. A much, much more sort of humanistic um, way of sort of thinking about the value of how, how meaning is created through art would be Kandinsky, some of these excerpts from Kandinsky's Concerning the Spiritual and Art. Let me look at the difference here uh, in terms of the ideology uh, between, say, uh, you know, Kandinsky's ideas and, and Marinetti's, right? He says, the idea itself is charmed by the beauty and other qualities of color. The spectator experiences a feeling of satisfaction and pleasure, like a gourmet who's tasting uh, with a tasty morsel in his mouth. This is about sensuality, right? The eye is a, is a way to, to, to appreciate, to savor the world. Um, he says there's a psychological effect of color. For example, the color red may cause a spiritual vibration like a flame, since red is the color of flame. A warm red 
has a stimulating effect and can increase in intensity until it reaches painful sensations. I mean, being physically moved, emotionally moved by color. Um, color is a means of exerting a direct influence on the soul. Color is the keyboard. The eye is the hammer. The soul is the piano with its many strings. This is like poetry, right? The artist is the hand that purposely sets the soul vibrating by its means of this or that key. Wow. So here I think we see that he sees color as, a, as the main, the main, um, the main key to the world, right? And the eye is the vehicle that, that makes a connection between the outside world and the, and the soul inside. So again, I think that's a very kind of different sort of poetic and humanistic um, way of thinking about the, um, the way of thinking about the role of art. And it certainly contrasts to the futurist's vision. Okay, let's move on from there. I want to, okay, let's see. These got a little bit out of order. I'm going to put that down here. Let's just look at Kandinsky for a second here. Wow, look at that. Um, what I want to point out here is not only its use of vibrant color, but look how close he's coming in 1913. This painting is over 100 years old. This is how long we've had non-objective art in our Western culture. Um, what do I mean by non-objective? That comes up in the slide lecture. Look how painting is just teetering on the verge of losing all connection to recognizable subject matter. Sure, we can kind of sense things in here. Um, landscape, maybe animals, um, even mi the microscopic world. However, it's getting harder and harder to see particular things that we recognize from the outside world. This is a big deal because as, we, as we'll see as we move on, there's a difference between abstraction, right, which uh, cubism is a classic example of abstraction because you're moving away from the recognizable objects. However, you retain them. Non-objective art is where you don't even start with an, a recognizable object. It is art outside the idea of uh, representing form from the, net, from the actual world. And the, probably the best example we have of that this week is uh, <clears throat> Malevich's Black Square. So here we are again, a oh, hundred years ago, and art, look at this statement that this artist is making. Now, of course, you know, I, I, t I, I, I think you should have a sense of humor when you're looking at art. And I look at this and I kind of say, wow, how many people have walked up to this piece of work and said, are you kidding me? A black square, <laughs> right? And so, yes, you have to kind of suspend your your disbelief around this idea that, um, oh boy, it, it would just be very easy to dismiss this as as kind of a, a arrogant statement, like why is this art? But you have to really think about the kinds of things he cares about. He wants to get at something so pure and so something outside of the kind of, look, think of it as that objects get in the way of pure expression. Right? And he really sees this as an avenue toward feeling. So where Kandinsky is, is seeing color as a vehicle for psychological for, for a psychological state or a feeling, uh, Malevich, Malevich is also trying to sort of get to that same place, but by clearing, 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 clearing out till you get to something that is almost like, well, can painting go any further than a black square? Um, and as the slide lectures talk about this week, this isn't the last time we'll be talking about artists who think they've maybe gotten art, specifically painting down to its most elemental or essential forms. So keep that in mind when you're looking at this. Sometimes you can only appreciate an artwork when you understand the artist's intentions. So to understand this is kind of appealing a way of what isn't necessary to get to the pure center of something, um, you'll appreciate that work more. Okay, uh, let's see. So for visual analysis, I think you know. I think 
to really do well in any course, you have to always loop back to the earlier material in the course. This is really important.